on behalf of uh, Bamer John Museum of Art, uh, I'd like to welcome you all tonight to our artist talk with Kurt Solmson uh, and uh, talking about the exhibition, The Yellow Boat, part of our Untold Stories um, series at BEMA. Uh, my name is Ken Matsudaira. I'm the director of uh, cultural and community programs at BEMA. And uh, I'd also like to take a second to, to introduce uh, Quincy Blackman, who's our tech uh, wizard for the evening and is going to be quarterbacking the Zoom, all the, the Zoom world for us. Um, so we'll get started um, with the program straight away. But before we do that, um, we just want to pause to acknowledge the history of the land upon which we stand and that before colonization, um, this was the land of sovereign people of the Squamish, the Wamish, and a host of other nations from around the Salish Sea. We acknowledge with gratitude their stewardship of the lands and waters from that surround us and acknowledge our history of colonialism and pay respect to our uh, pay respect to their elders past and present as they continue to live and protect the land and their cultures for future generations. Um, so I'd also like to thank our sponsors of Untold Stories, um, the uh, Bima Prism Cultural Pan Program, the City of Bainbridge Island, Laird Norton Wealth Management, the Ames Family Foundation, Leslie and Michael LeBeau, Stoll Reeves, and KCTS9 for um, their support of programming at uh, the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art and for this exhibition. Um, I'd also like to let you know that we have a couple of other events coming up, um, an altered books uh, presentation uh, on the 28th and drawing from memories of nature workshop on the uh, September 12th. You can get more information about any of these programs at the BMO website, um, where you can also donate to our programs if you so choose. Okay, so um, if you uh, are having trouble viewing, you may try adjusting your view settings to gallery view. Um, you should be able to find the menu controls for this up in the corners of your screen. Uh, and uh, we'll be having uh, a question and answer, uh, fielding questions and questions from the audience um, through the uh, Q&A app that you can also find um, with your Zoom controls. Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to turn the program over to Justin, Kurt, and Greg, who are going to be giving you the rest of uh, our virtual tour and artist talk about uh, exploring uh, Kurt Solmson's The Yellow Wood Exhibition, showing now at BEMA until September 22nd. Thank you for joining us tonight. Hello, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, I'm Justin Ferrati and um, welcome to this evening's pr uh, presentation. I'm, I'm not the center of the attention. That, of course, is, is Kurt Solson, uh, who will be the uh, show that we're going to be, be viewing and examining. And hopefully, uh, you'll all have the opportunity to come to the museum to, to see Kurt's work. Um, there's a famous quotation uh, about Sir Christopher Wren, the famous 18th century architect that said, if you want to see his, his, his majesty, look around you. And so I want to say the same thing for Kurt's show. As you go to see the exhibition, you're going to see the, the things for which Kurt has become very well loved and, and very well received. So a little bit of background, Kurt um, uh, originally is from Philadelphia. Uh, and studied at what is the oldest art institute in America, the Pennsylvania Academy uh, of, of Design. And um, Kurt would study with some of the best artists in the country. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience. But his family had long associations with Vaughn Washington and Kurt would ultimately end up living in Vaughn. And what makes Kurt's work, I think, so especially important for this museum show is that many of you looking at the work will recognize recognize that there will be a sense of familiar. Even if you don't know the specific site, it will evoke memories that you have had, sites you have. But we will talk more about that. I think it's important to understand that Greg is 
I, I'm Craig, I'm sorry, Kurt is first and foremost an artist. And what that means is that he is looking through his particular lens. And that's what we're going to be uh, looking at tonight. You'll look at the images, but remember these are not photographs. These are not uh, uh, simply looking at the image and putting it down on canvas. Kurt is constantly going through all sorts of ideas and processes. And for me, that's what makes the art so exciting is when you start seeing the artist at work. Kurt was surrounded at the Pennsylvania Academy with tremendous artwork as one of the finest art collections in the country. And so he was able to, as a student, just wander through the corridors and look at this tremendous art, which was very fruitful in, in helping Kurt finesse his own techniques, figure out what he wanted to, to look at the questions that the artists were asking themselves and to ask himself similar questions. And so when you look at the exhibition, remember what are the questions? What are the questions that the artist is asking? Um, so um, we will uh, be looking at, uh, at Kurt's work and then we'll hear mostly hopefully from Kurt himself who will discuss what he looks at. And I will, I will ask prodding questions just to, to get Kurt to talk. Kurt tends not to be He's not very show off -y, and I am. So, um, so I'm more than happy to push Kurt to, to answering some of the questions that you undoubtedly possess, some of the questions you really want to know about his work. So with no further ado, I will pass you over to Greg Robinson, uh, who is the curator at the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art. And I have to say on a personal level, I've known I've known Greg for, it's sort of scary, 40 years. Um, and, and I have to say from just a purely selfish uh, perspective, I, it's so wonderful to know that Greg has really reached a, a, a pinnacle. It's a very important point in his career to become the chief curator at the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art. This is a joyful experience for him. And I think it's an incredibly positive experience for the museum. He will, he's open, he's willing to look at new ideas. He's willing to experiment. He's willing to do all sorts of things that will push the museum into the future. And I cannot say too many, too many wonderful things. So the, uh, Greg is blessed by having a wonderful position, but even more so, the museum is blessed for having Greg. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Justin, very much. And um, what we're going to do this evening is I'm going to give a tour for those of you who haven't seen um, the exhibition. We do have some installation shots. We'll talk about that. Um, Justin um, and Kurt will talk um, more formally about Kurt's work. And then we'll turn it over to Ken, who will handle the Q&A, and you can add your, um, your questions into the chat box. And before I give the tour, I just thought Kurt could say a few words um, himself about having a about him, himself and having a show at Vima. Thank you, Greg. Uh, uh, thank you, Justin, for your introduction, and thank you for your writing for the book. Uh, I want to express my gratitude to Cynthia Sears for, for having the inspiration to create this wonderful museum. And, and I want to thank Greg and Amy Sawyer, the associate curator, uh, and all the people who have worked very hard to make this exhibition a, a successful one. And uh, I have some things to say about the first slide. I, I don't, uh, I think we could proceed to the, to the, uh, to the tour and then I have things to say about uh, the particular paintings as we go into it. Great, okay, Kurt, I'm going to um, screen share and we'll get to the PowerPoint presentation. And I wanna thank Amy Sawyer who was the co is the co-curator of this exhibition with me and um, also um, for putting this PowerPoint together. And um, Hunter Stroud also on our um, staff who has been handling so many digital programs he had done a series of beautiful installation photos, which we'll be using tonight. Wanted to just, um, this um, piece that you see in this introductory slide, Labor Day, um, is in the Cynthia Sears collection. And it has graced our lobby, I think at least three times um, prior to this exhibition. We, for those um, who aren't as familiar with Vima, we're, we're still relatively new. We opened in 2013 and, um, we have um, 
um, used this as a seasonal um, piece several times. And um, thanks, Justin, for joining us from Santa Fe and for being one of the essay writers um, in the book also. Um, the book is shown behind Justin when we get back to looking and um, it's available in our museum store for $48 and 10% um, off for members. So um, as Ken mentioned, the show will be running through September 22nd. Um, and um, well, I wanted to just give you a sense of how this has been put together. Um, Kurt has been working for over about, or about 30 years now and putting together various series of work. And when we, when we start talking to an artist about doing a show, of course, we want to understand all the different series of work, the different themes, what are the most important pieces to the artist, which pieces might be available from collections, private or institutional, um, but also how can we introduce, if I, if I were really just to tell a story, a walking tour story, where would we start? And um, it's a little bit of a trick at BEMA in that we actually have two formal entrances up the grand staircase and also the elevator. Um, people new to the museum um, and also more mobile love to come up the staircase. People are seduced by architecture. We have a wonderful building by architect Matthew Coates. So what we've done is we've um, sort of broken the ice on how we would tell the story by grouping a series of studies. Um, these um, drawings also find their way, different drawings in the galleries. Um, we've selected a piece that combines some of the painting styles. It's a newer piece, both more representational and also abstract. Um, and of course, the exhibition is titled The Yellow Boat. So um, we wanted to reinforce that with some smaller pieces. You'll see much larger pieces incorporating the yellow boat. So this is just kind of how we get a conversation started. There are a whole series of pieces that have to do um, with both um, some architectural elements that I find repeating themselves. I love these kinds of porch scenes or combo interior exterior views and how Kurt um, literally frames, it becomes in my mind, um, a, a series of paintings within a painting because he's using these um, window frames to frame different things. And we played off of that. And also as you come into the main gallery, um, on both sides of the double glass doors, you see um, various um, pieces that, that play off of the exterior views and also his family members. This is um, Kurt himself um, holding um, one of his children on the left. So that's an older painting. Um, and we just played sort of um, with literally being outside as if you were getting familiar with, with Vaughn where he lives in the surrounding area. And then we, um, also um, wanted to um, reinforce this idea that we've used some studies um, of portions of paintings that he's done um, and, um, and found that those are especially helpful to families with kids or um, this summer, we are having some um, summer camps um, showing up now that COVID has relaxed things enough that small groups can come into the art museum. Um, we love, um, to um, let kids know, or, you know, sometimes you walk into an exhibition and you see the, the best and finished big, big work, and a kid might feel a real gulf between themselves and the artist. You know, they may appreciate the work, but they don't really conceive of how they could ever get there, how they could become an artist. And we talk about um, all kinds of, of audience members and what our goals are as a nonprofit art museum. One of our goals is, of course, um, I want um, to, to um, help to um, stimulate more young lives to think about pursuing careers in art. So we, we have been including some pieces where they, you know, every kid does a drawing of some kind and they can see that they could go further with it. Um, and then we've created kind of an interior space with these movable walls that we have because there are interior views, um, either scenes of um, sleeping in bed, um, or um, dining room scenes, but we wanted to get that sense that you, you've left the outside ring, so to speak, of the exhibition, and now you're coming inside and looking at, at some of those views. And then um, there are um, um, other pieces um, that are um, 
they're they're either kind of one-off or they're combinations of pieces like paintings from Tacoma. There are, if you see on the right, um, there's a newer piece that goes more abstract than a lot of what he um, is known for. And there are other pieces such as that. Um, what was what drove this decision was the fact that um, from after interviewing Kurt extensively, um, we all came to the conclusion that he does have a number of series, but unlike some artists who do a particular series one decade and that stops and then they do something else and that stops and you know maybe there's a thread through with their work, but there's distinct series that are chronological. Kurt over the 30 years has worked in a variety of series and goes back to them. So there's not a chronological story to tell here, but more a thematic or variety of thematic stories. And then the winter um, section that has become extremely popular with visitors, a really nice surprise kind of, um, if you came up the staircase, it's the last section you'll see. And um, one of the pieces um, which you see um, straight on here, um, Kurt will be talking about tonight. So um, that's just how the, the, the um, exhibition is organized. And, um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Kurt and we'll talk about the first um, formal painting, RG and the Yellow Boat. So I'm going to um, run the slides while Kurt and, Jace and Justin talk. Thank you, Greg. Uh, RG and the Yellow Boat. Uh, my grandfather, my mother's father bought this boat in Tacoma in 1935 from a company that made, they nailed together one of these boats a day. And he rode the boat to Maury Island where he, he lived. And um, uh, the boat's made out of big planks of cedar with oak rails. And uh, in 1942, during World War II, uh, he had to get a special license for this rowboat so that he could row it into the port of Tacoma from the Navy department. And the license says, I still have the license. It says no arms or ammunition. At, at some point this, this boat, which was varnished at the, for a long time, it's, at some point it was lost in a fog and it was hard to find. So after that, uh, they painted it bright yellow. So after my, uh, my first year at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts in Philadelphia, I came out to Vaughan and I started painting the landscape here. And this boat was a really nice piece of cadmium yellow color uh, to have in the, all the blue and green of the, of the Northwest landscape. So in a formal sense, uh, I like to paint, to paint the boat because of, of it, its color and the beautiful man-made curves. Uh, a painter whose work I admire that I'll, I'll talk about more in relation to some of these other paintings is uh, Fairfield Porter. And Porter wrote that uh, when he did paintings of the interior of his family's home in Maine, he felt like he was painting a, a portrait of his father. And in, in that same vein, um, I think that painting this yellow boat and, and the house that we live in is a, a sort of a portrait of my mother and her parents who work so hard uh, on this place. Um, if I can interject here. Yes. Um, one of the things that, and this has nothing, I mean, the family connections I think are very powerful and very intense, but from an aesthetic and an artistic level, what Kurt is not telling you that yellow is one of the most difficult colors to work with as an artist. It can be very twee, it can be saccharine, it can be too perky. And yet Kurt keeps coming back to this yellow as an anchor for many of his works. And the yellow is, is it's intense, it's warm, it's the color of sunshine, it's the color of light, it's the color of, of energy. And you really get that in this particular work. And I think it would be helpful, Kurt, if you told people how this work came into being. Okay, uh, well, uh, well, how it came into being, it's a real place. And uh, 
one day I was, this was at my mother's house and uh, I was looking down from the porch and I saw my brother, Archie, sitting on the steps and the, the yellow boat was floating near him and uh, there was September light sparkling off the water and I was very excited by this image. So I, I went back to my studio and I, I took a, a big 50 by 70 landscape that I had been working on that was very static and I wasn't too happy with it. It had a, a yellow house and a very big blue sky and a, a, a field in the foreground. And I took a big stroke of yellow paint and I put that in the sky to indicate where the boat would be. And I put another stroke of ochre colored to indicate the light on my brother's back. And that was the beginning. And I went very quickly from there to make this first painting uh, in the series, which was called Yellow Boat in a Blue Bay, 1999. And this painting is another one in that series. And uh, I've noticed that uh, the, uh, the posture of the figure and, and the way the boat is positioned uh, is different in each painting and also has a different uh, mood. Uh, the first painting, uh, my brother's figure was coiled as if he was gonna uh, get into the boat and row off. In this painting, He's more relaxed. He's sitting there. He has a bottle of beer, it looks like, and his shoes are sitting there and he's contemplating and he looks like he's content there. So I think in some ways these are sort of like self-portraits, although I didn't think of it that way at the time. Um, I, there was a, uh, there was a, my niece Charlotte saw a, uh, a blog, a French blog that had a poem that was written about this painting. And it says, uh, it talks about uh, something like island boy, uh, while, while people work in their offices in the city, you, you have not a care in the world and that sort of thing. And, and uh, my brother's children thought that was very funny because that's really not his personality at all. But uh, the, my point is that uh, I, I, I try to have narratives that are very subtle. I don't like to have a very obvious narrative in these paintings so that people can find their own uh, story, perhaps. Um, I think that's a very important part of Kurt's work in general because he invites the viewer into the painting and asks the viewer to give it their own personal meanings. Um, and what I do want to point out about that work and this work and subsequent works, as Greg pointed out, the importance of the structure of the piece. Uh, Kurt regularly uses vertical and horizontal and diagonal forms to create a sense of tension and excitement and yet anchoring the piece in, in its place. Back to you, Kurt. Okay, well, this one is called Marcia and Forsythia. And uh, as, when I first moved to Washington in 1988 in the wintertime, the first thing I did was build a studio and uh, I got some big pieces of glass from a secondhand yard and uh, a friend designed the studio around these big pieces of glass. I was thinking about Richard Diebenkorn at the time, you know, with the light streaming in, I thought I would paint uh, in that vein. And um, at the same time, I bought a big mirror at this secondhand yard. And uh, while we were waiting for the uh, permit to build the studio, we made this big wood frame. And I thought, well, I, I could use this for self-portraits, but I, I never could really, uh, I didn't do a self-portrait in that, in that mirror for 32 years. Um, uh, and it, after 32 years, I finally finished the interior. I put insulation and drywall in, uh, and the, something about the light and with those white walls made me want to try again with this mirror. And, uh, this show at BEMA had been scheduled and I wanted to do something ambitious. So I started this painting. Uh, originally, I started with a little photograph of, of Marsha, our daughter, when she was 12, near the mirror with a table, uh, because that's one of the early attempts I started with. But I, I realized there wasn't enough information in the photograph. So I, I asked my daughter, Marsha, now uh, uh, 29 years old, if she would pose on weekends. And she came out and posed with her daughter who was in the painting for a long time, uh, sitting on her lap while, while Marcia read to her. 
And so as the painting developed uh, over the months, uh, the light was changing from winter to spring and, and I was worried I'm not gonna be able to resolve this painting uh, uh, because the lights changed so much. Uh, and so at, at a certain point, I decided, I decided all this, uh, this, these shapes, as you look through the mirror, I had kept you know, working on the, uh, the smaller patterns and you look through the door and I decided to take uh, our granddaughter Avery's figure out of the painting. And at that point it worked. And uh, it's not because, you know, I take painting, I put figures in and I take figures out of paintings all the time. It's not any reflection on, on how I feel about the person. It's it's does the painting work? So that's you can sort of see her. It's as part of the uh, the variations in the leather chair. Um, so uh, this this is a this Fairfield Porter did a self portrait titled "The Mirror" in 1966, which was an homage to Velasquez, Las Meninas, and so this painting is sort of an homage to Fairfield Porter. I brought this chair up from the house, uh, which I'd used in other paintings, and because Porter's painting, the mirror has his daughter in front of a mirror like this in a wooden chair, and he's in the mirror uh, like Las Meninas. So this painting uh, is sort of an homage to uh, to Porter's painting. If I can interject here, this really reminds me of Las Meninas, who for those who are not familiar is one of the world's most famous paintings by the Spanish painter Velazca. And it is it includes in this very complex social image of the ladies in waiting for the Infanta, the princess of Spain. And Las Meninas means ladies in waiting. So you see all of these women in very grand dress and you see the painter in the background, sort of like, like almost not there, but there. And it's a very sophisticated painting. It's a very complex painting. And frankly, it's rather courageous for Kurt to take on this topic because the painting, like so many of Kurt's paintings, actually has several stories going on simultaneously within the painting. And, and for me, that's what keeps the painting alive. That's what makes it exciting. That's what generates excitement when you see it. This one is called Sunset Interior. Uh, when I gave a slide talk at the Gage Academy, a young painter, uh, Christopher Martin Hoff, asked an insightful question. He said, do you paint the figures in first or the background? And that, that's a very good question because when I first tried to paint the sunlight that comes up off the water in the wintertime and the sunset illuminates the front room of our house in the wintertime, the first winter, I, I really had a lot of trouble getting painting the figure in this kind of shimmering light. And at the end of the winter, all I had was this uh, uh, scrape down, scrape down amorphous uh, color. And then at some point, I think the next winter, I had a, a photograph of, of Lauren in that painting, sitting in that kind of sunlight. And I just quickly painted in the figure on top of all that am uh, amorphous color. So when I did this painting in 2017, I already knew I wanted to start in with big brushes, uh, big slabs of color uh, and, and paint the space and all that light you know, uh, in the whole space. Uh, I use tape also, and it just it, as quick ways to get uh, a lot of uh, paint on there. Uh, and, and then uh, my wife, Becky, came into the room holding uh, Avery, our granddaughter, and was talking to me. And I realized I wanted to have them right there uh, lit up against that dark background. Uh, and so my wife, Becky, and, and or uh, Marsha, my daughter stood there. So it's sort of a painting of both of them. Again, this is a case where the combination of Kurt's use of color, which is really very, very impressive. Just take your eye over the painting and look at the tremendous range of colors, but they all sing together. They're harmonious, but there's also very sharp use of 
angles, lines, horizontal lines, figures. Notice how the light goes across that table to give you a sense of direction that points to the, the figure of, of, of Marcia and, and her child, or uh, the other very, I think lovely, lovely details, the way that the Bentwood chairs seem to come out at you, seem to approach, like say, pull up a chair, make yourself comfortable, but there's a, a the whole painting itself focuses without it feeling didactic. It's not telling you, you must look here, but it's all, it's like you're drawn to the figure and the use of the dark versus the light, I think is a tremendous uh, uh, visual enticement. This one is called Catnap. Uh, I was telling a friend uh, one day, you know, I wasn't sure what to paint and we were standing in the kitchen uh, and our bedroom is off the kitchen. And uh, I think Becky was sitting on the bed with a cat or two. We had five at that time. And my friend said, uh, paint that. Uh, and we have this big old bed with an ornamental headboard that my grandparents bought at an estate sale years ago. Uh, in 2014, uh, I went to New York and, and saw a show by uh, Balthus, or we say Balthus, and it was probably the best uh, group of paintings I've ever seen. And I, I came back home and uh, looked at the winter sunlight streaming into the bedroom through these red curtains and uh, uh, started to paint this. And uh, uh, I tried to make the the curves of the uh, the way I painted the uh, bedspread and the sheets and Becky's figure and the cat, I wanted them all to sort of echo the curves of the wood uh, of the bed. And uh, so I have lots of drawings. There's one in the show of this of this bed uh, at a certain time of day. I would, you know, it, was, it was all done uh, at a certain time of day. Justin, do you have any? Well, I, what I really like here, again, is uh, the architectural aspect of the bed. The bed is very striking. It's a very, has a strong physical presence. And you've done a wonderful job with the shadows on the wall, which sort of echo. But what's interesting, again, is that while the bed is architectural with its curves, its vertical shapes, its wonderful sort of voluptuous finials, the softness of the shapes on the bed, the, the use of the fabric, the blankets, even the body has sort of that sort of softened uh, gentleness to it that is a nice contrast. So it really one plays off of the other. I think what's also really important is, again, the color relationship between that red orange of the window curtains and the light that comes through and the playoff of the green. And again, look at the number of colors within those, those walls. They're not, it's not a green wall. There's a multiplicity of color that gives it a wonderful ambience. You really feel a sense of place and a sense of space. Um, it's, it's a delightful work. If, if I can jump in here, um, one of our visitors stood before this painting, which is in that interior space, and said, this feels like a cathedral with light coming in from heaven, just the way the whole thing's painted. Oh, thank you. I'm really glad that this painting is in the show because it's, uh, it's a little different than some of the work I do. There's no long, long distance to it. You're not looking off and it's quite personal. So, uh, uh, I, I'm very pleased that it's in the show. Okay. Snow at Vaughn. Well, uh, the first time that I painted one of these 10 foot long diptychs, I was doing a painting at the Davis house, which is right down the beach from here in the snow. And uh, I had started the painting on a 50 by 70 canvas, which is was uh, sort of a typical format for me because it was the biggest canvas I could fit in the pickup truck I had starting in the 1980s uh, when I went out landscape painting. So, it was, uh, but then I realized there was snow was coming down and I looked out across the water and I wanted more uh, expanse. So I went back to the studio and got a canvas that was 50 inches high. It happened to be, I think, 48 wide or something. And it had a, a sunrise through fog already on it, but I just painted over that for that painting, uh, that was 2008. So uh, this painting of our house was painted also in a snowstorm. 
uh, a painting also similar to this, same size, I had done an earlier year. It, it actually took me three years to paint that other painting, and it's in the book. Uh, it's the one it talks about cross hatching, where I, I was spinning the painting around to get the this sort of a velatura of paint uh, to to make the whole thing work. This painting I did very quickly in three days, I think, because uh, I just wanted to. Uh, paint it as quickly as I could. And uh, I stood out in the snow. You can see uh, as the snow melted on the oil, it makes certain patterns which are unexpected. And I try to use that. I got up early in the morning so that the light uh, from the house was visible. It's just first light. Uh, and it's just so beautiful on the water when it snows like that. The tide is out and the snow is still on the beach. Uh, and I was thinking of, uh, uh, Al, uh, Alex Katz, who, who's, who has a famous uh, saying, uh, no noodling. So <laughs> I was trying to do this painting uh, with no noodling, you know, just get, get the paint on there with big strokes and, uh, uh, and let it tell the story. I think the thing that is quite remarkable, there's almost a Japanese simplicity to the work and the use of the violets in the trees are, are very emotive. They, 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 they bring a sense of power and, and grandeur and mystery to the work and almost feel like an ink wash uh, in their looseness with your brush. But I think also important is the balance of the lighted building the darkened building in the back where the trees, as I said, are almost darkling trees. You're not quite sure what's going on there. And yet you see that glorious horizon that goes off seemingly endlessly with that beautiful, beautiful sense of violets and lavenders. But what might be helpful for people since we talked about the importance of asking questions and Greg had also talked about the importance of kids understanding that this is a process, you do many things. Why, if you could just say a few words about why you chose to do this as a diptych, because I think that's a very important- Oh, right. Topic. Yeah, well, for one thing, uh, I, the first one I did was be, to, to add an expanse and also the mobility or the transportation question. How do I carry a 10 foot painting around? These are all practical things that I thought about afterwards. This is good because I can carry the painting, you know, and put it in a vehicle, you know, uh, I couldn't put a 10 foot painting in, in any vehicle. How would I ship it? How would I get it to a gallery? Uh, and uh, also uh, when I'm looking at a, a, a big expanse of landscape, one turns your head. You, you look one way to see the house and you have to turn your head to uh, see the other view. So in, in that way, it makes sense. When, the, when this painting was in uh, the show at BEMA, a, a man came up to me and said, this is the uh, this is the Da Vinci golden uh, ratio that you're doing. And, and, you know, he gave me the numbers, and he said, "You may not know it, but you're 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 painting the uh, the golden triangle." And I, I didn't know that, but I, I have all these more prosaic, practical reasons. But that was an interesting comment. I don't know what you think about that. But you had also mentioned in the past with you've done more than one diptych, and you've talked about how and very much in what you're keeping with the idea of how you're looking in two different directions. What it also does is it gives you a sense of bending the view, uh, which is a physical sensation. And were this simply a flat image, if someone did a panoramic photograph, for example, there'd be a flatness to the image that isn't what you experience when you look at it. And, and when you look at this painting, ironically, the artifice of the diptych is what gives a sense of the physical presence of being there, of actually experiencing being there on this cold, crisp, snowy day and looking at the lavender light off the snow. I'll um, mention that this is one of two very large paintings in the exhibition. And in, in addition to the variety of work in the different series, people have also commented on the diversity of scale of the work and how they're they're really enjoying kind of going in and out of you know different experiences also due to, due to the scale 
this one is called uh, November, and uh, it says 2021, although it, it's not November yet. <laughs> but uh, when I finished it and and framed it and all that, um, it was 2021. But this was painted on uh, a few uh, November days when it was sunny, not windy, the kind of beautiful late November, mid November, and it's a kind of day when you know that this can't last. You know, in a week it's going to be raining and windy, and all the leaves are going to be off. That the the peach tree uh, leaves were that bright orange. So I wanted to paint this as quickly as possible, as economically as I could. So I stood on the beach and I painted uh, from the steps and the house, big brushes, very directly, sort of saying, "I don't have I don't have time to waste here. Uh, I want to get this recorded." And but to paint the water, I, wa I, I wanted to be out on the water. So I, I went onto a, a raft and I did one small study. And then the next day I took this painting in the boat and I set it up on the raft and painted it very quickly, uh, painted the water. And uh, I had painted on a raft when I was 25 years old. And I was thinking and I was wondering, can I do this? Can I still do this <laughs> without falling in? And uh, I didn't fall in. Uh, and uh, so this was uh, this painting was a lot of fun and uh, and and uh, quickly done. The the work itself, people often refer to Kurt's work as realist work, but it's not realism. It, it's it's remarkably sophisticated abstraction. And what you see here when you look at this painting is, and just look at it and you can understand what I'm saying. Notice how he's reduced everything down to basic geometric forms, the sense of horizontality, the idea of its fall, it's autumn, things are falling to the ground, that sense of being close to the earth and those lateral lines in the water, the lateral lines on the shore, the lateral lines created in the sky are just, it's an emphasis that the season is changing. This is, is this fall in a very literal sense. And, and what I also love here are the use of, of, of colors that are associated with people like Hans Hoffmann or, or uh, people like uh, uh, Wolfgang. Wolf it's very much Wolfgang palette. Now, for those who don't know Wolfgang, he is a very famous painter. He only died recently, but he would take these colors, these colors that seem not to make sense, these brilliant magentas and purples and violets and brilliant yellows and oranges. And somehow when they come together, just as they do in this painting, you feel like you're there. This is the emotion that you get when you look at nature. When many of you think of autumn leaves, I'm sure this painting will bring all of those sensations back to you. And that's the joy of, of this work. Um, I also, if I can digress from my digression, um, I'm impressed by how the show has been mounted and my compliments to the, the installation of the show because what the show has allowed you to do as a visitor is to have these intimate moments with these intimate works and be it on a big scale, be it on a small scale, you have the ability to be with that painting and let the painting talk to you and very importantly, to let you to talk to the painting. So um, the, the ex exhibition I think is, is really well done. Yes, I agree. I just sort of uh, stood back and watched Greg orchestrate uh, with the preparators and the volunteers, you know, let's move these walls in here and, and he was telling the story and then uh, when everything was placed, he said, I think we have a show and everyone clapped and uh, it was a, it was a lot of fun really to see it to see um, it being done. Thanks, thanks Kurt. Um, Justin, I love the analogy of the falling leaves. In, in autumn with this you know I was I, this was one of my favorite pieces in the show because of the the reflection that and as Kurt said he painted it quickly and I can imagine him trying to balance out there on a raft and you know how much of what you interpret is deliberate by Kurt like is he really thinking about all that or does he allow us to the gift of you know, creating this big flat thing. And then we actually have an entire book to read. It's, you could just go on and on with this painting. And I, I really am enjoying this discussion. So for the audience, this was just six um, 
paintings picked out of, you know, almost over 30 some. I, I forget now because, you know, we've opened the show and we're just talking about it. I forget the details of how many pieces we've actually mounted. Um, but that's just six. And I hope that you can come and see the show or see it again. Um, I want to thank the, of course, you know, we're part of an ecosystem in the art world. You know, artists don't work independently of galleries or art centers or art schools or museums or anything. And I, I love to think that we're just all working together to um, really foster and promote artists. And I want to thank Linda Hodges Gallery in Seattle and Llewellyn Galleries in Santa Fe, um, New Mexico, where Justin is from. And um, I think that's the end. I would just also really like to thank the Tacoma Art Museum um, and all the collectors that we were able to borrow from. You know, it is complicated putting a show together um, in terms of feasibility, expense, shipping, et cetera. And um, the good news is so many people have collected Kurt's work that it wasn't hard um, or overly expensive to be able to mount, mount this show. So I'm going to stop share and turn this over now to Ken Matsudera, who will lead us through the Q&A. Thank you very much, um, Kurt and Justin. Thank you, Craig. Sorry, it was muted. Um, thank you, Kurt and Justin. It, it was wonderful to hear your insights into the works and hear some of the stories behind the paintings. Um, I can't tell you how, how wonderful it's been to be able to walk through the exhibition you know, on my way to my office uh, when, I'm in the, when I'm at the museum. Um, so I would like to, to open it up for questions uh, now. If you have questions, please feel free to enter them into uh, the Q&A. Uh, app down at the bottom of your screen. I think you should be able to find it for most folks. Um, Lori has a question here. Is there reception this Friday at BEMA for First Friday? And will Kurt be there? Um, yes, I, I will be there. Yes, I will. Um, BEMA is open again for First Fridays, and that is from six to eight. The official museum hours now are, um, you know, virtually every day through the run of his show from 10 to five. So you could come anytime from five o'clock to eight o'clock. And, um, but first Friday for um, Bainbridge Island in general is um, I think technically six to 8 p.m. We're not doing food. We're not, you know, they're still with COVID. We're being careful. Um, masks are optional for visitors, um, but, you know, recommended and uh, the, the staff, um, you know, we're happy to um, help answer questions and things, but, but um, it's a great opportunity to meet the artist. I see there are uh, other artists um, who are on uh, display as well. Do you want to say any, a quick word about them, Greg? Sure. We have um, Nancy Callum and Catherine Gray, The Clown and Me Loves You. If you happen to drive by BEMA, um, mm -hmm. you see the big round um, circle, which is a play off of a clown's nose. We're actually getting people who are um, coming in they're, they're, They assume it means something, you know, or, or they'll be walking across, coming off the ferry and they'll, they'll um, Google, you know, um, and then find out what the shows are. So um, that's helping. We have work from the permanent art collection. We have a beautiful show every day in special days um, from the Cynthia Sears collection of artist books, co-curated by Cynthia and um, Catherine Alice Michaels. Um, we have that as well. The museum store is open on first Fridays. Um, it's, you know, we're, it, it's, it's just great to be doing that again. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Kath Mays. I'm curious about Kurt's design process. The paintings have such strong design. They remind me of my favorites with Hopper. Kurt, do you use small sketches to refine the design from which um, from what you see in front of you? Yes, I, yes, I absolutely do. That's a good question. There are quite a few pencil drawings in the show. Uh, Greg wanted to use working drawings from specific paintings. And yes, I do a lot of drawing with just a number two pencil uh, on paper. And uh, I take photographs and uh, refer to them uh, and most, they're all painted from life, but I do go back and do drawings as I'm working on uh, a painting to sort of uh, uh, study 
particular parts uh, of the painting that I'm looking at, you know, what, what, what's really going on there. And so, uh, yes, I, uh, I tend to, to uh, use very strong verticals and horizontals and some very strong uh, diagonals, you know, to, very, to make a, uh, I, I tend to start with big shapes and then and work down into patterns of smaller shapes. And I think of it in a kind of a musical terms too. I, I listen to a lot of Baroque music, not when I'm painting, but if I'm cleaning up the paint or I, I like Bach very much, uh, J.S. Bach because of the, uh, the mathematical patterns. And I think about that uh, maybe even subconsciously it is in my paintings that there are all these patterns that are uh, developing as I, as I work and I get more uh, involved in the, uh, not detail, but, but understanding what's there. Uh, and then there are certain areas of the paintings that are more defined than others. Some, some areas are, are much looser and, and broader. When you visit the exhibition, I think it, it, it behooves you to take special time to look at the drawings because you will see in the drawing some of the processes that Kurt is going through. And a lot of it is reduction, it's reducing. Kurt has already mentioned that sometimes figures go in, figures go out, uh, angles change, sh sh things shift. And people often think of studies as like a miniature of the final work, but that's not really what a study is about. A study is for the artist to examine what is, what is happening here? What is the response? What is my response? What would the viewer's response be to this? How can I, and I think a classic one is the yellow boat story, which started with an image that was totally different and that Kurt just transformed the whole image with a few brush strokes and suddenly it completely reoriented the work. One of my favorite things about the yellow boat that's in the show, uh, the one particular one that was shown on the screen, is how the boat seems to levitate. It seems to float and it's counterbalanced by the, by the leafy greens of the tree. And there's a wonderful dynamic going on. And so these are, these are the functions of, of the studies to figure out what the dynamics are. That's just I'm sorry, how you also pointed out the, the use of lines, the vertical, you know, diagonal and things. Um, I wanted to just say about the studies, there is a wonderful study of a, the cat. Um, or one, one of the cats over time. And um, Kurt was talking about, and a lot of visitors do ask about the process. How do you build your paintings? What do you paint first? And um, the painting, um, Reading Sociology, where Kurt's daughter is reclining in a big overstuffed chair reading a book, what we tell visitors is the daughter was intent on reading the entire book. So that wasn't such a problem, but the cat wouldn't sit still. And that's the cat that's why, didn't. That's why he had to. Yeah. Do well, actually, that cat was very smart, and he knew when it was time to pose, and he would jump up there and sit there the entire time. Actually, he was an incredibly good model. But I just wanted to say that Justin uh, was talking about the school that I went to, and uh, we were surrounded by these great paintings. Uh, Winslow Homer's The Fox Hunt was right there by the door uh, where you go from the school studios to the museum. You could walk out and see that. I saw that painting every day. So the, the, the variations of paint on, on a painting like that, the quality, the paint quality is what I guess you could call it, is so beautiful. And that is what uh, I, I try to attain, you know, uh, variations in the surface, which comes from working on a painting over time and uh, other parts show through and you have uh, a, a history of the painting, which the viewer doesn't have to understand that uh, tech in technical terms, but hopefully they'll feel that, you know, they'll get that impact from the finished work, all that uh, history, that trial and error uh, that we were talking about. I think that particular painting, which if you don't know it by the name, you would recognize it's a picture of this brilliant white snow and this red fox uh, crossing the snow. But the thing is that, that Kurt really uses white 
remarkably well. And for those who, who may not realize this, white is not one color, it's many, many colors. It's actually a com combination of all the colors in the spectrum. And how a white appears can be whether you have a little more red, a little more blue, uh, you know, and it can change it dramatically. And what what Kurt does, especially in his winter scenes, is creates that wonderful sense of luminosity, that sense that the snow is sort of emanating light uh, when you look at it. And that's because of Kurt's understanding of what you're doing with the different whites. And within a painting where he's using white, he may use as many as eight or 10 different versions of white as he's mixing it on his palette to, to, to create that sensibility that he's looking for. Um, I think it's important to, to understand when you look at Kurt's work that he is, he is painting air. He is painting light. He is painting things that are intangible and yet are very real. And, and so when you look at the look at the works, you know, sort of celebrate the glow of an orange yellow light, celebrate that afternoon beam coming down on the on the bed covers. You really understand that what Kurt is reaching for is that physical sensation. And with the physical sensation comes the emotional sensation. Yes, well done, well said. <laughs> Just uh, you talked a lot um, uh, before about um, about Kurt's use of color, especially brilliant yellows, and and uh, the way that that he works the colors um, in his composition. Um, Lisa is asking, how do you work out your color palettes? Well, uh, I've used a certain palette with some changes, but uh, some colors added. Sometimes I've painted in places where uh, I needed some other color, but pretty much I've used uh, the same palette for, it's about 40 years since, since I started painting. And uh, uh, I, I put them out on a certain same place on this big, I use, when I paint outside or inside, I use a great big piece of plywood, you know, more, more space to mix. And I just put it right on the ground when I'm painting outside and prop the painting up with a, a, a one by two on a hinge and just crouch down like a, a baseball catcher because I used to make, uh, I used to use easels and they blow away uh, in the wind. So, uh, uh, but in terms of the color, uh, I, we didn't talk about this, uh, this uh, bonfire painting, but that's a painting that I was painting sort of in the dark uh, as it, after sunset, I could hardly see what the colors were, but I knew what, what they were on the, on the palette from where they were. And I was sort of painting tonally. Uh, but Justin was talking about different whites. I use uh, lead white. Uh, there are different kinds of lead white, flake white, cremnance white, and then uh, titanium. And uh, I use another co uh, color called uh, uh, by Rembrandt called nickel titanium yellow light, which is extremely strong in tinting. It's a bit like a very, very, very light yellow that's sort of like, almost like white. And I use that, uh, like when I'm painting the snow, if I want to get a really bright white, I'll use that. Uh, and uh, and uh, I could go through the whole palette. I'm not sure you want me to do each color. <laughs> Uh, but I, I use uh, good quality, very good quality paints, and I'm always, uh, uh, well, these days searching around for where, what, what brand of, uh, what company's making lead white these days, because that sort of changes. And cadmium too. So I use some poisonous colors, uh, which I just can't really uh, find. A, they're so beautiful. I, I, cadmium yellow, cadmium red, flake white, cobalt blue. Uh, so they're, they're, they're rather dangerous, but, uh, but uh, uh, sort of irreplaceable in my mind. Kurt had mentioned the concept of music. And I think it's important to understand that when Kurt is selecting his colors, he's creating a symphonic uh, concept. He's creating the idea of the interrelationship what does this color do to that color? What 
what, how can this color change that color? When you look, especially at the November painting, look again at the colors and the colors, if you took them out and said, here's a swatch of this color, you might say, no, no, that won't work. And yet when you see that color interacting with another color, when it's having a conversation with another color, suddenly it creates this melodic experience. And, 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 Kurt's use of color is very sophisticated because he's understanding there's a panoply from which to choose, but there are only certain ones really interlock, interconnect, uh, intercommunicate. Just very briefly, the reason you know the painters like to paint from life and outdoors, plain air, is that there's so much more information. You know, instead of using the oh, I have green here, I know that green, or there, just there's so many color so many things to 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 uh, look at and, you, and just getting all the information and and choosing from all that information uh what's going to uh to to uh, to try to simplify it is the challenge really and and kurt alluded to it but let me go into greater detail because kurt's methodology of working on plein air i think outdoes virtually anyone i've ever seen he creates these physical easels out of the painting. So here you have this painting stuck out in the middle of the out of doors and Kurt is busy painting while it's snowing, raining, sun shining, while it's doing whatever it's doing. And, and that's often an intrinsic part of what Kurt does. Sometimes the, the drizzle can be can commingle with the oil of the surface of the painting and can actually transform the painting. And Kurt is consciously, and I'll, I should let Kurt talk more about this, but uh, Kurt has mentioned how those things can actually transform how a painting how a painting looks. And and it's it's in a similar way. Uh, the uh, the technique that Kurt alluded to, the Valatora, which is a, a thin glaze over the painting that is transformative. It's sort of like looking at the painting through a scrim, but it's a it's a very pale, almost uh, colorless scrim. Well, when I uh, moved here from Pennsylvania, I had done uh, winter paintings back there, but moving here, uh, it was it was difficult to. Uh, come to terms with all the gray skies, you know, months and months of uh, gray weather and fog, mist. And so that was a challenge. And I, I, I used to make the tents, you know, portable pop-up tents and all that kind of thing. And then out of, I guess, frustration, I just said, the heck with it. I'm just going to go out and paint. I don't care if it's raining. Uh, let it rain on me. And, and uh, that's when you, I got started to find that all these uh, uh, things that happen when oil and water mix and <laughs> they don't always want to mix but uh they do make these uh interesting patterns uh, uh so trying to uh describe this beautiful minimalist northwest winter uh beauty is uh was it, it's sort of a never-ending uh uh joy really uh, we, to, and to be on the water is is a is a wonderful thing because it's always it's always beautiful looking out uh, in the wintertime. The, the low skies also come to mind with the November painting because one of the things you feel is the, is the sky is hovering. There's a sense of the painting hovers in that whole sense. And again, it, it underscores the nature of fall and the change of the season and the change of the light. And you really feel that physical transformation that you feel when fall is coming. You know, there's, a, there's a visceral response as human beings we all have when autumn is, autumn is imminent. We really, it, we sense it to our very being and that's what Kurt is capturing in that painting. We've got time for about one more question, but before we get to that, um, a comment from Kathleen Waldron. We'd like to thank you for celebrating the light and beauty of the Salish Sea. Um, thank you. Our final question is coming from Josie Turner. Um, when you're doing plein air, some of your paintings, like the one at the Haley property, an abstract, how do you determine how to tape or not tape a shape? Uh, well, I think it's, uh... In that case, in that painting, it was very, uh, uh, it wasn't deliberate. Deliberate. Um, I mean, when I was painting that painting, uh, it was on top of something else. There were the other colors underneath. And I, I painted it to a certain point and I realized 
you know, that's it. I don't, I'm not gonna do anything else to this. You know, it works like that. Uh, the tape, if the question is, when do I use it? It's for, for a sharp edge. Uh, I've only been using tape for a few years. I, I was working on some uh, bronze. I, don't, I didn't mention this, but I do sculpture conservation. And I, ha I, had, I was taping onto some stucco and the, the painter's tape didn't stick. So I went to the store and they said, well, try this green tape. It's, it's for mortar, concrete, and brick. And, I, and when I got home, I realized it sticks to wet paint. So I started using it uh, again to, to get the paint on the campus as quickly as possible, big pieces of paint. And I could use the tape for that uh, and then pull the tape off and it, gives, it can give a straight line, a uh, sharp edge. So the, I guess the answer to Josie's question is uh, if I want a sharp edge, I tend to use the tape. And uh, sometimes it's kind of a structural tool, you know, to help build build these big pieces of paint quickly. There's a comment that I, I made in the in the text of the book, um, but uh, one of the things is and, and Kurt brought up is conservation work, working on sculptures. The thing with doing conservation work, it's very physical. It's very hands-on in every every literal sense of that. And one of the things that I find inspirational about that is that as human beings, we have physical memory. It's like a dancer can consistently hit a certain point in space because that's the body memory. As they do a, something on point, it's suddenly right there, you know exactly where it is. And, and Kurt gets that. It's, it's a subliminal thing that happens when Kurt is actually working on the sculptures. He's feeling the curvature, the shape, the hard edge, the shot soft edge. He's feeling those things physically with his body, which because painting is a very physical activity. It gets carried over into his painting. And I think you can sense that when you look at his paintings, you really sense that it, it's a very tangible kind of painting. He's not, it's not an abstracted form, it's a physical form. And you really, it's, it's a different meaning, but in a very real sense, it is an action painting. Well, I would like to thank Kurt and Justin for, for their amazing analysis and, and giving us so much information um, into your work and, uh, and giving us insight into your process. Uh, I'd like to thank Greg for uh, his incredible uh, tour. And I'd like to thank, on behalf of BIMA, thank all of you for joining us tonight and coming out to support the arts. Um, we are so happy to be presenting these series and I hope that you will join us for future ones. Um, for more information about upcoming uh, programming at BIMA, please visit our website and um, we hope to see you first Friday. Um, so you, if you have other questions you'd like to ask Kurt then, um, please uh, come and approach him and, and I'm sure that he will have all kinds of, of just wonderful things. Uh, to share with you. I have one comment I'd like to add, which is any good exhibition deserves more than a one-time visit. And so mentally set yourself up for a show that you're going to find very exciting, very stimulating, and you're not going to be able to take it all in in one viewing. So come to see the show, pick out the things that you respond to the most, treasure those and then come back and revisit them. Come back and see them a second time and show your friends. Show your friends say, this is what I respond to. What do you think? What is your response? Because that, that's what Kurt's painting is encouraging that you do. Thanks everyone. And the, um, the book, um, Kurt Solmson, The Yellow Boat is available online through the Bema store. Thank you, Justin. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, you to uh, Quincy for yeah. our tech support tonight. Um, and what, uh, again, thank you all for joining us. And it's been a pleasure spending the last hour with you. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.